To share thoughts on the Sensible City, please welcome Carlo Ratti, Director, Sensible City Laboratory, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Yes. Um, can we see the slides? Yes. Um, so I want to share with you some of the work we're doing uh, both at MIT Sensible City Lab and also in design in our design office at uh, Calorati Associati. But the first thing I wanted to start with is something we discussed this morning is about trying to see how cities of the future will look like. And I want to show you how people 100 years ago tried to think about urban life in the year 2000. This was a group of uh, French artists over 100 years ago who imagined the future of agriculture. They saw a lot of mechanization. This actually happened. Um, they also invented kind of Roomba at the time for cleaning automatically our homes. But many other things they didn't get right. When you look at mobility, they thought we would all be moving with drones, um, or you know that firemen would do this, which hasn't happened, really. And so basically, uh, this leads to the fact that we cannot really predict the future. This was stated in a very compelling way by Karl Popper and many others. You know, the future is open. It's not predetermined. No one can predict it except by chance. We all contribute to determine it by what we do. We are equally responsible for its success. And so I think what is very important, and this should be part of the conversation today and what we do in research and design, is really how we can explore how the present could be transformed, how cities could be transformed today. And today there's a very interesting opportunity which is related to this. Is this convergence of digital and physical? Is the internet becoming internet of things? You know, giving rise to what many people call, with a terrible name, uh, smart cities or, or sensible cities. But still what is behind it is something quite profound. For instance, we can look at a city like this today. We couldn't just a few years ago. There's actually a city of Lisbon mapped using billions of data points from the taxi network. Uh, this was a MoMA Museum of Modern Art in New York done by Pedro Cruz, a former researcher from our lab at MIT. And that's a city how we can see today, but we couldn't just a few years ago. It's data, as we said many times today, that allows us to understand and analyze what goes on. And when we analyze this data, we can discover interesting things. Uh, that's the same data in New York. And we, for instance, asked a few months ago, what is the minimum fleet we need in order to run New York taxes in a more efficient way? Here's a short video. So, and uh, if you're interested, by the way, this is the, the paper just a few months ago where this, uh, this was published. Uh, basically, we can use data from the city, analyze it, and try to see how different things could be transformed. In this case, for instance, looking about mobility. But this was, the data I showed you was about showing one car like one point through GPS. But every car is becoming now like a computer on wheels. Every car has thousands of sensors, like what you see here, part of a research project we're doing with one of the car manufacturers that actually allows you to collect uh, a lot of signals in real time, in near real time from the car itself. And when you add two additional sensors, like the two little ears that you see there, then you know, those ears are called LiDAR. They do a three-dimensional scan of the city. And then you feed all of that, the information from those sensors into an artificial intelligence system as what you get, as we said today, is a self-driving car. And when you got a self-driving car, many things change. The first thing that changes is that today a car is parked 95% of the time. But if you've got a self-driving car, the car can actually, doesn't need to be parked, can give you a lift, and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family or to anybody else in the city. 
So some of the research we're doing now in Singapore is looking at how could this change? In Singapore, you've got 1.3 million parking spots today, but actually could go down to less than 400, well, 410,000 here, but even less with other assumptions, uh, if you got a self-driving system. Or you can look at the impact of self-driving on other things, such as this. This is a well-known traffic light, and uh, traffic lights appear on our roads when cars appear on our roads. But if you've got an intelligence system where every car knows where it is and where all the other cars are, you don't need to stop anymore. You can keep on going, just avoiding collisions, like this. Don't try it yet. You know, I showed this, uh, this video in Naples, and they told me, so what is new here? <laughs> now, I'm Italian, so I'm allowed to make such politically incorrect jokes, but I need to tell you that the former Italian minister once said that in Milan, traffic lights are instructions. In Rome, there are suggestions. In Naples, there are Christmas decorations. <laughs> well, when you get to this kind of intelligent way of running vehicles, then this, the road itself can change. And that's something we've been studying, for instance, in Toronto with Google's sister company, Sidewalk Labs, that's part of the project on Water for Toronto. And I think about the road that in the morning is used by cars when you've got a lot of traffic, but then at midday it can be used by kids to play, so you can easily reconfigure the road. And incidentally, if you are in Paris just today, we just opened an exhibition in Paris where we're showing at the Pavillon de l'Arsenal, uh, an exhibition place in, uh, in the city, uh, the future of the periphery, uh, and uh, you know, been working with the city in order to imagine, again, how we can use space and uh, space on the road in a more dynamic way thanks to technology. Now, the final thing I want to share with you, again, with mobility is about this. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of uh, images such as this one and plenty of articles saying you know, that the future of mobility in cities will be like this. Now, this beautiful object, but I don't think that this is the future of urban mobility. And the reason is that technology can change many things, but technology cannot change physics. And the physics means that if you want to take a weight and just keep a weight in midair, let alone move it, you need a lot of energy, you generate a lot of disturbance, you need to move a lot of air, and you generate a lot of noise. Maybe we'll be able to deal with noise, with more noise cancelling in the future, but the other two components are still going to be there. So uh, just to give you an example, in, uh, in Manhattan, there's a few helipads with a few tens of flights every hour taking off, and everybody complains. But if you wanted to have an impact in Manhattan, you wouldn't need tens of flights an hour, you need tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So I don't think this is the future of uh, urban mobility. I think drones could be very useful at smaller scale to sense the city. They can also be very useful in places outside of cities where we lack infrastructure. Very interesting projects with drones in, in Africa. This is a project with small scale we've been doing with uh, highways, you know, looking at little drones, sitting on poles, sleeping there, and then just you know, moving around when you need to monitor, monitor the highway. Or we've been working with drones on our own campus at MIT. And you need to know the MIT campus is a, is a very difficult one. It was designed by engineers. Every building has a number. You know, a lot of people get lost. So we developed this project to help them, and in particular, to rescue Harvard students. Welcome to MIT. Where would you like to go? Follow me, please. and artificial intelligence lab is the largest research lab at MIT. To your right, the media lab. To your left, research. the status center. Follow me, please. Okay. 
welcome to Sensible City Lab. Now, I need to tell you a secret. Actually, the student playing the, Harv the, the dumb Harvard students was actually from Yale. So uh, anyway, um, I'll, uh, I want to finish with one slide, which is this slide. So basically, what we need today, I believe, in cities is not trying to predict the future, how cities will be, but more experiment with the present. Only if we do that, if we do that as uh, city administrators, as researchers, as designers, then we can avoid more of this. Thank you.